an allergy season in the south. Amen. Yeah. Allergy to our uh, main two seasons, allergy season and hurricane season. We're right in the middle of both of them. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible, we turn to Matthew chapter 21. And, and I'll tell you, I appreciate you being here today. You could have chosen to be anywhere else, but you chose to be with us, and I thank you. Matthew chapter 21, and if you want to, you can turn over to Mark chapter 11, and just kind of hold your finger there, because we're going to refer to it in a moment. <clears throat> uh, Matthew chapter 21, and I'll reread it for my own benefit, says in verse 17, And he left them, and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it, and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away, and when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Amen. Blessed of the fig tree, week six. Uh, in, in our five weeks so far, uh, we, we've looked at several lessons from uh, actually what seems to be a pretty insignificant incident in the life of Jesus. I mean, it just kind of goes by in just a couple verses, doesn't it? Jesus walks out. He's, he's, uh, he's going out of the city of Bethany. And he, he sees this fig tree that's got all these leaves and no fruit, and he curses the fig tree. And, and from that, we have, we have accomplished five weeks, and fixing to be six weeks of preaching. You're going to be amazed when I tell you we're going to end up with at least seven. Amen, because that means I'm not going to finish today. But just this little blip on the radar of Jesus' life, it seems very insignificant in the grand scheme of things, doesn't it? It's just another fig tree. I mean, probably countless, countless other fig trees Jesus had seen, sat under, enjoyed the fruit of. It's just another fig tree. But, but listen, from this short interaction, the cursing is what most people call it, or the judging of this fig tree, I'll go ahead and tell you, I've learned a great deal. See, in the order that, that I have gone, and, and there, there is no right or wrong order, it's just the way I've done it, is the first thing that I have revealed, or I see it revealed to me, is that Jesus deals with presumption. That, that is how Jesus deals with the presumptuous, hypocritical nature. Jesus is not interested. He has no use for the hypocrite. He has no use for the presumptuous. And those who are presumptuous and hypocritical are in danger of the judgment of God. Amen. You see, we talked about how out of that we, we used as an opportunity to talk about how we operate as a church. Why we do what we do, why we do how we do, and and, and I'll go ahead and tell you, I stand firm in the conviction that I do not presume to manufacture anything. I do not think and I do not believe that we are called to try to manufacture a move of God. Amen. Amen. So we'll just leave that right there. If you want to know what I'm talking about, back up a few weeks and re-listen. This is available on archive.org or, or YouTube, either one. There, there's a way to get to it. But second, we also talked about that there's a general consensus among theologians and scholars and uh, uh, biblical geniuses, uh, which I do not claim to be one, but that this cursing of the fig tree is symbolic and is a prophetic word. It is a pr prophetic object lesson concerning the nation of Israel, concerning the soon coming judgment and destruction of Jerusalem. You see, the problem is, is the nation of Israel had produced plenty of leaves and no fruit. And, and it was evident that they had done so because they even rejected their Messiah. Horrible thing to say, but you know what? That there, that there's a whole nation of Israel today that is secular. And you wonder if they even believe in God and, and we know they don't believe in Jesus. Third, the third 
week we took time and we looked at the principles that we can learn from the cursing of the fig tree. Uh, from it, we can see that just as with the human nature, the, the utter depravity and the lacking nature of the sinful man, we see that sinful man has the potential to produce a lot of leaves, a lot of window dressing. You know, from the flesh, we can do a lot of good things. We can feed the poor. We can help each other out. You watch what I'm telling you. If a hurricane does as much destruction as it has the potential to, non-faith groups will run to the forefront alongside of faith groups to try and help other human beings. Now, it won't last long, and they'll do it because it makes them feel good or because... You know, some people do have some courtesy and conscientiousness about them. But at the end of the day, Jesus curses this fig tree just like he has already cursed the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh will not produce salvation no matter how hard you try. No matter how much money you give. No matter how many prayers you pray. Until you repent and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. By the power of the Spirit of God, the works of your flesh are nothing more than filthy rags. The Word of God has already declared that that tree is cursed. Amen. You don't have to worry about it. I'll amen myself, son. I'm, I'm good at it. You know what I'm talking about? Amen. Huh? And, and fourth, we talked about, and, and using that same basic principle is, is that we need to examine ourselves, not just individually, but as churches. See, now I'm not going to tell you that you need to go out and try to put every church under a microscope. What I'm telling you is the church universal, in other words, the current age in which we're in, uh, we see that there are bodies of believers, or, or unbelievers, I'm not sure what some of them are, that have risen up, that produce a lot of leaves, but don't produce any fruit. And you go, well, why would that matter? We live in the age of grace. Well, because the Bible says that if the unbelievers are going to be judged, where does that leave us? Because it says that judgment will begin at the house of God. Jesus' judgment started in Jerusalem. What do you think? We're going to be without, without reproach? Come on, man. The book of Revelation is very clear that Jesus expects certain things from his church. He expects things from the body of Christ. He has expectations for his church. I hate to tell you. Easy believism and greasy grace are false teachings. Jesus died for you so that you could be saved and that salvation ought to produce some kind of fruit, especially as part of a body of believers. Revelation 2.5 says, Remember therefore from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto you quickly and will remove your candlestick out of its place except you repent. If you don't believe that Jesus will pass judgment on a church, then you're, you're, just, you're very short-sighted in your belief. Now, is it my job to know when that's going to happen? Not at all. My job is to preach the truth. My job is to encourage and empower and try my best to energize you to follow what this word says, which presumes that you are reading the word. Amen. Verse 4 tells us, though, why Jesus has passed judgment on the church of Ephesus. It says, you have left your first love. You know, a word for the church, and I heard it 20 years ago, it, it is the same word that we need today for those that have turned to light shows and smoke machines and every gimmick under the sun. What you need to do is, is dance with the one that rung you, son. What are you talking about? Dance with the one that rung you. You, got, you didn't get here by the works of the flesh. You didn't get here because of smoke machines and gimmicks and, and a building that looks like some kind of a club. No, you got here by the Spirit of God. You must return to your first love, and that is that the Spirit of God not only empowers you, He will help move you and encourage you and energize you to do the work that He's called you to do. Quit looking to everything and anything other than the one who runs. Amen. That's a, that's a good word right there. I remember the first time I heard it. I thought it was awesome then. I still think it's awesome now. 
week five, though, we move from talking about the, the church universal to the individual believers. And I ask the question, if Jesus were to come examine you today, what fruit would he find? And better than that, better, better than that what fruit would Jesus expect to find in the individual believer's life? Well, it's just not that hard to understand, is it? Well, the Bible tells us exactly what the well, what happens with the flesh? Then he tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And you don't need any law out there to make a Christian produce or bear these fruits. These are not something that you struggle to produce. But rather, Jesus said, abide in me. Abide in me. You are, I am the, I am the vine. You are the branches. You can do nothing apart from me. So it doesn't matter if you get out there and struggle and grind. You will never produce fruit. But if you abide in Jesus, if you make sure you're plugged into the Spirit of God, plugged into the Word of God, plugged into the knowledge that Jesus is the only way, you will bear fruit. The idea is, is that we not only abide in Christ, we rest in Him, and we are obedient to His Word. He produces the fruit. All we do is bear it so the world can see it. So that being said, one of the things that you can know is, is that you are nothing more than a branch. And branches have purpose. The purpose of the branch is to do what? Hold fruit. Branches hold fruit, which hold seeds, which are meant for what? Multiplication. That's what seeds do. They multiply. What kind of fruit would Jesus be looking for in us? First of all, he wants to see the fruit of the Spirit. And he wants to see, if nothing else, us trying our best to get the seed of the fruit that he's put in us into this world so there might be some multiplication. Week six, though, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to change, change the attitude a little bit. We're not really going to talk about the fig tree at all. Just the effects of the fig tree. I'm going to ask a question. Don't raise your hand. It's kind of a rhetorical question because if you were to answer it incorrect, I'd call you a liar and we wouldn't be friends. And you know what I'm saying. I mean, this week I have learned that, that, that people are mean and people are hateful and people are not courteous or conscientious. And I have been accused of things this week I never thought I was accused, could be accused of by people who don't even know me. I explain, I want to explain to them don't hate me yet. At least get to know me. And I'll give you plenty of reasons to not like me. You know what I'm saying? So just keep that in mind. So let me go ahead and ask this question. Keep your hands down. Uh, but I, here's the question. Do you or have you ever struggled with faith? Do you or have you ever struggled with faith? To ask that question because I sincerely believe that if you're a human being and you have not put on your glorified body yet, you have a struggle with faith. And the reason why I believe that is, is because Jesus spent so much time teaching about faith. Now, I will go ahead and tell you this too, that me and the television preachers would probably not get along here because I'm not looking for some egotistical answer that, that would tell me, oh, I've never struggled to have faith. I never struggle in anything. Well, if that's the case, you don't need Jesus. You're perfect if you don't struggle, okay? I'll tell you this, or have you ever felt, we're going to use that F word I don't like, have you ever felt that condemnation when you hear a preacher speaking of faith? Or you hear someone else talking about their faith. Have you ever wondered, is there something wrong with me? Or is there something wrong with my faith? I know none of y'all have because y'all are perfect. And I appreciate every one of you. You see, but I have good news for you. You're not alone if you are one of the imperfect, okay? You see, the, the wonderful news is the greatest 
people that the Bible calls people of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 struggled. Abraham was a liar. Abraham, the great man of faith, Israel kept him on a pedestal. Him and Moses both kept him up on a pedestal because they were men of great faith. But Abraham was so fearful that he lied to protect his own self. Moses murdered a man. Moses ran from God in the wilderness for 40 years. And these people are called men of faith. David, a man after God's own heart, surely, surely he never struggled in his life. Come on, man. He was guilty of adultery. He was guilty of having a man murdered under his watch. And poor old Gideon, I like to think about him, such a great man of faith. The, the angel comes along and says, man, you are a man of power. He said, you talking to me? How many of us, if the angel of the Lord was to come down now and speak that in our lives, would we go, You're, you found the wrong one? Gideon was out there uh, threshing wheat down in a hole, trying to avoid getting caught because the Midianites were going to come and take everything he had. So he was hiding, and the angel of the Lord comes and says, Hey, you mighty man of valor, he said, you've got the wrong man. Of course, he had to have wet and dry fleeces, and even then, that wasn't enough. What I'm trying to tell you is that some of the greatest people you know struggle with faith. Here's even better news or worse news, however you want to look at it. I know of 12 men, great men. Jesus called them himself, walked with him daily lived with him, ate with him, saw him, interacted with him. I'm talking about looked him in the face and talked to him. They saw the miracles firsthand. They knew what the power of Jesus Christ looked like. And when Jesus cursed the fig tree and it withered up, the Bible says they marveled. Marveled. They were amazed that Jesus spoke to a tree and it withered away. Now, <clears throat> that may not strike you at all, but I start asking the question exactly how dull are the disciples? And if the Lord would pick people who are, quote, unquote, not bright, that's why I say dull. I don't want to call them dumb or, or unsophisticated or unlearned or anything. I'm just telling you is they seem to be a bit dull or a bit dim-witted because they have watched Jesus for three years and you're telling me all of a sudden he does what would be sent to me in my little old mind a simple miracle and they're amazed they marvel maybe they're just maybe they're duller than I think or maybe they're just slow to learn right I mean, because I know the Lord doesn't have to deal with you over and over and over and over again about the same thing to get you to get it, does he? He tells you one time, you read it one time, and that's a wrap, son. You move on to the next item, don't you? What are you talking about? Y'all know, y'all know what? That's just not true. You know that you have read things in that word that you go, I'm moving on to the next thing. I don't want to hear that. I'll tell you one that has that, that, that plagues me. And it's, it's not fearful or anything else. But anytime I read the words in red, I pay more attention. Jesus made a comment one time. He said, be ye perfect. As my Father in heaven is perfect. If you want to get to heaven on your own, if you want to work your way to heaven, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to be perfect. Even more perfect than the Father who is in heaven. And that reminds me every day of why I've got to lean on the grace of God. Amen. So these 12 men who saw Jesus' great works just don't get it. With the direct nature of their relationship to Jesus Christ, I wonder if they struggled with their faith, their believing, where does that lead me? Well, it leaves me really hopeful, to be honest with you. Because 
Spirit of God has been given to us. The indwelling Spirit of God is, is here. We have a complete version of the Scripture in any translation pretty much that you could possibly want. If you can't understand King James, get you a new King James. If you can't read it and understand, or if it won't get your attention, let's get you an NIV, NSAB, <laughs> ESV, whichever one you want, man. I'm not going to discourage you from any of them. I want you to get in the Word of God. There's, there's going to be enough truth and enough faith to turn your heart from that Word. So it leaves me hopeful, but it also steers me away from teachers who boast about great faith. If you begin talking about a certain preacher and I seem to just turn you off, it's because I've quit listening. Preachers and teachers who stand on television or in pulpits and start boasting about their great faith, I'm done. I move to the next man. Why? Because the, the disciples did not boast of great faith. The apostle Peter had enough sense in his, in his gospel, which I believe was the gospel of Mark, to, to describe himself. So he had a little faith. You see what it does though is it also reminds me of the, the truth that I must live my life by day in, day out, moment by moment, minute by minute. And that is God resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. You, you see the disciples reaction uh, has garnered a statement from Jesus. They come and they marvel. They're like, they, I, I can just see it. They're, they're like little children going, Lord, I can't hardly believe you spoke to that tree and it's dead. Just like that, man. That is, how, how did you do that? Now, if I'm Jesus, and, and of course, obviously I'm not, and Jesus is not near as sarcastic as I am, I promise you that. And he's not near as mean as I am, I believe, at times. But I believe that Jesus should have turned to them and said, Are you kidding me? You're going to get excited and happy about a fig tree being cursed? But you wondered and asked and, and murmured among each other when I fed 5,000? You, you got mad that day when I kept the people around and we fed them. And y'all had this attitude, that Jonah attitude, like y'all wanted to get to the other side. I wanted to take care of the people. I want to know, where's your faith? Matthew 6 and 30 said, Wherefore God so, uh, God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall, not he, or shall he not much more clothe you? And he describes the disciples. He says, oh, ye of little faith. Matthew 8, 26, after they had been in the storm, Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat. They're scared to death. They go back there and they tell Jesus, Jesus, don't you care that we're dying? Jesus gets up, rebukes the wind, and in the storm, he asks them, he says, why are you so fearful, O oh, ye of little faith? Matthew 14 and 31. When, G, when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water, and he told Jesus, If it's you, bid me come to you on the water. And, and Peter, in a moment of clarity, in a moment of true, biblical, unwavering faith, stepped out of the boat and began to walk on the water. Then he began to sink when he began to take his eyes off of Jesus. The object of his faith got out of his perception and he saw the wind and he saw the waves and it says he began to sink. And Jesus asked him a question. He said, oh, ye of little faith, wherefore did you doubt? I can almost hear the Lord say when I start aggravating him about certain things, I can almost hear it in my spirit. Oh, ye of little faith. Where's all that doubt coming from? See, because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now look, it doesn't say without faith and a little bit of doubt, it's impossible to please God. No, the Bible is clear. God is pleased by faith. Now this is where it can get a little cloudy, but I'm not going to, we're not going to try to do that. 
because there is a secondary lesson in this cursing of the fig tree. And it's not prophetic at all. It is a teachable moment. Jesus sees the reaction of the disciples and rather than going, well, look, y'all, I was trying to get y'all to see that Jerusalem fixed to go down. And, and I'm going to tell you what, for the ages to come, people need to be examining themselves, making sure they're produ or, or bearing fruit and not just producing leaves. And he could have told them all that. They'd have still stood there like cows looking at a new gate like, all right then, Jesus, if you say so, no, Jesus now, instead of taking them into the prophetic, which they wouldn't get anyway, because obviously they're, they're duller than I am, or as dull as me, he uses this as a teachable moment. So in the strictest of context today, remember what Jesus has been doing. He had just had the triumphal entry in the, in, into Jerusalem. He had wept over the city up at basically weeping over the nation. He had went into the temple and cleansed the temple. He did what there? He passed judgment over the people in the temple. When he leaves and sees his fig tree, he passes judgment on this fig tree. So the teachable moment, and in that context, the, and the, the whole of the, well, let's do it this way. If we took all the miracles of the Bible, let's put this one where it goes. Think about it for a minute. Why I say this seems like a small miracle. The greatest miracle of all time is creation. There was nothing. God spoke. And now there's everything. That is a miracle. The next thing is the next miracle that I come across that I believe was a miracle was the flood itself. God, God spoke and the flood came. Judgment came on this earth. And, and then you just go a little ways further and, and people don't recognize them as miracles, but the plagues of Egypt were miracles. They were not just prophetic, but they were an example of God's power. We see the, the splitting of the Red Sea. We see water from a rock, manna from heaven, quail just brought in by God's word. We see fire from heaven. We see a floating iron axe head, which goes against all logic, right? We see Jesus feeding 5,000. So I would say, just from my perspective, this seems like kind of a small miracle. But they marveled. And instead of berating them like I probably would have, Jesus begins to teach them about faith. Now, he has changed, though, a little bit different. Before, he says, oh, ye of little faith. He has said that if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could speak to the mountain and it would move. So before, he had been speaking about the quantity, the volume of faith. But here, he's not. Here, he changes the focus. And you have to go to Mark to see it because he says, have faith in God. This is not about an amount of faith, but this is about the object of the faith. He, he focuses on the root problem, which is not, quote, unquote, enough faith, but the problem is what their faith is in. Many people today have lots of faith. It's just not in the right thing, and it's not in the right person. You, you see, they heard, and they saw Jesus curse the tree, but for some reason... They doubted anything would happen. Let that sink in. Kind of, I mean, conviction right here, okay? How many times have I prayed for or with somebody or I had no somebody, I saw them pray, I heard them pray, and there was all this faith, and two days later they'll tell you, I knew what nothing happened. If that's the way you pray, do me a favor. Don't pray for me. Amen. If you can't pray in faith, believe and keep it to yourself. Amen. Amen. The disciples' problem is not that they don't have faith. Their problem is that they are eaten up with doubt. And honestly, we really don't 
don't struggle with faith, do we, like we talk? No, we struggle with doubt. We don't truly believe God will do what he said he'll do. That's true. I hate to say it. I honestly hate to say it, but there's something in the human nature, there's something in this flesh that doubts God. The struggle is not faith. The struggle is against doubt. And here's, here's why I see it hopeful for us, because we have the Word of God. But the thing that is so frustrating about these disciples is, is they doubted in spite of their circumstances. They, they doubted in spite of their experiences. Fight the good fight of faith. And fighting that faith is overcoming doubt. Amen. Mark 11, 22 says, Have faith in God. That is a command, okay? That is not a request. And that is a direct command that your faith must be in the correct object, which is God Almighty, the God of this Bible. Because here's what I want to tell you today, and this is going to be a quick little buckshot bridging on faith. You know everybody's got faith. Everybody's got a little faith. How, how do you figure that? I call it common faith. You don't know what common faith is? You use common faith when you got in your car this morning. You had faith that when you put the key in there and turned the ignition, it cranked. You came in and sat on the pew this morning. You had common faith that it's going to hold you up. You have common or probably pretty great faith if you drive in Mobile County. What are you talking about? Well, the county and the state have put up these great barriers between you and the person in the other lane, and they're called yellow stripes. That keeps the people over there. They can't get on your side of the road. That's why we hear about people getting killed in head-on collisions, collisions because we have too much faith in another driver. Everybody has faith. I'll tell you what, you'll have faith today. If you go to a restaurant, you have faith that that cook has washed his hands. You have faith that they have bought good, good product to sell you. You have faith that they're not going to poison you. You have faith. That that waitress is going to keep coming back and keep the tea glass full. That's common faith. But I'll tell you what, that faith is not what Jesus is talking about. You see, common faith is just simple belief. We just kind of believe by experience. People's going to do what they're supposed to do, and if they don't, the law's going to step in and take care of it. Another thing that the Bible tells us about faith is James tells us faith without works is dead. There is a such thing as dead faith. It is faith that does not work. It is faith that has no action. Faith with no leg. Just dead. And then the one that nobody really wants to talk about is the fact that there is a thing called demonic faith. You find that in the book of James too. It says, you say you believe, you do well. So do the devils. They believe and tremble. Of course, our problem is, is we have raised up a whole generation of people who believe but don't tremble. They have no fear of the Lord before their faith, and it is evident by their lack of repentance. And then there's what we call saving faith. And the great part about saving faith is, is you didn't, you didn't develop it yourself. Romans 12, 3 says, I say for the grace given unto me. To every man that is among you not to think more highly of himself or think more highly of himself than he ought to think, which is pride, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. If you will respond to the calling of God, if nothing else, if you will respond to the, to the idea, to the truth that he is the creator, he'll, he'll give you a little more truth and a little more faith, that faith will grow, and he has given you the faith to be saved. Here's the next thing. The Bible also defines itself. It defines its terms. You don't have to wonder today what sin is. In the book of 1 John, John tells us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit exactly what sin is. 
Anybody know what sin is? Sin is transgression of the law. Well, what if I don't know the law? Well, if there was not a law against it, there is no transgression is what the word says. The problem is, is that the moral law, the standards that God has put before us, we are without excuse because he's written them on our heart. And if you want to know what faith is, the Bible defines it for you. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is, not might be, not will be, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you right now, that Elizabethan English gets a little, little tough sometimes. So every once in a while, I'll get one of my modern translations, and the, and the, the Amplified, I really like the way they, they define this verse. In the Amplified, it says, Now faith is the assurance. It is the confirmation of things hoped for. In other words, there is this divine guarantee and the evidence of things not seen. In other words, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as faith fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. I don't believe it because I can see it. I believe it because it's true. Amen. So in the context of what we're talking about, there are some preachers and teachers who will say, see, that's all you got to do is name it, claim it, blab it, and grab it, fake it till you feel it, son, and it's going to come your way. That is immature faith. That plays on the, the, the insensibilities of the human mind. But in the strictest context, what Jesus says is if you had faith in God and doubt not. This makes an assumption, by the way, that for all us disciples, all of us followers, all of us who would name the name of Jesus, all of us who would carry the gospel to the world, it, it assumes, it assumes that we will need to pray. It assumes that we will commit to a life of prayer and asking for things from God. In other words, it presumes that we will what? Humble ourselves daily and often under the mighty hand of God so he might do his work. Have faith and doubt not. What are, we or not. what are we not supposed to doubt? You don't doubt him. You don't doubt his promises. You don't doubt his character. And you don't doubt his truth. You see what Jesus is telling his disciples is, is not only will you put down and put to silence the presumptuous, leaf-bearing, fruitless hypocrites of this world because they are going to come at you from all sides. There are going to be people who are going to ridicule you. They're going to try to kill you. And they will ultimately succeed at times. But you are going to be able to what? You're going to be able to speak to that and put them down because you have faith. And don't doubt. You got a good example of that? Preach the word is what Paul said. Preach the word. Don't preach your feelings. Don't preach what you think. Don't preach your opinion. Preach the word. Brother Philip, what do you think about thus and so? You're going to get the same answer every time. It really doesn't matter what I think, but I will tell you what the Bible says. Why? Because my opinion doesn't build faith. My opinion will create doubt in me if I'm not careful because I'll start thinking, I'm not really sure why I believe that. I just know it's my opinion. I think this may be true. Let me tell you something. Faith comes out of, I know what God said, and that settles it. You see, he says, if you had faith, and if you don't doubt, you can speak to this mountain, and it'll go get to see. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you like this. A lot of people, this is where it shows the immaturity of faith. When you become mature in the faith, what you start realizing is, is that there are some mountains that God has absolutely allowed in your life, and you can speak to them all day, but what you need to do is pick up that shovel he's given you and start moving. Start digging. 
start working. You see, what he's telling them is you're going to have some obstacles come, it come your way. They're going to look like mountains the devil has set in front of you. And if you have faith and don't doubt, you'll speak to them and they'll flee. But a mature faith understands and knows that when I come up against something and I can realize it's God's intent for me to learn something, I just keep plugging. Keep trusting. What, what do we trust God to do? I, I, I'm going to hammer it until I figure it out. We're going to learn to trust God to do what's right, and we're going to trust Him to do what's best. If I speak to that mountain, I know I've spoken in faith, not doubting and the mountain is still there, more than likely, I haven't heard from God yet. Maybe I haven't learned the lesson yet. Lord help me. You see, Jesus assumes that they're going to pray. Jesus, Jesus assumes that they'll be asking and believing. And he also assumes that you will receive without doubt. The disciples would soon be finding themselves in a place where they would have to depend on God and God alone. Those of you on this last page already. The question that comes out of this is after hearing what Jesus said, is this a blank check? Is it? Well, if you believe it is, then you don't know God and you don't know his character. You need to get in the word just a little more. That there are some obstacles in your life God gives you to produce patience and endurance and perseverance. So praying to remove it is praying against God's will. What you must do is get in the Word of God daily. Dig into it, read it, ingest it, digest it, put it to work, begin to live it out, and all of a sudden you will begin to learn the mind of God. And the only way, hear me, I am dogmatic about this, as much as I like experience, as much as I like worship, as much as I like fellowship, as much as I like a lot of the things that the Bible tells us we need to do, none of those build faith. Your experience will not build biblical, lasting faith. There's only one way. One way to increase your faith. Come on now, Philip. You sound pretty pretty sure of that. I am. Because I believe what the Word of God says. The Word of God says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And if all the word you're, if the only word you're getting is on Sunday morning, you ain't getting enough. You are anorexic. You need to gorge yourself on the Word of God. Why? Because in the Word of God, I all of a sudden learn that God created everything. That's good enough for me. Keep it simple, man. I live by the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. You don't have to complicate it. When people want to get into some theological argument about, well, you know, Philip, there's light and we've got this problem. I have to look here, man. It's a whole lot easier just to believe. God created everything in six days with his word. That's a whole lot That's simpler to live that way. Word of God says, by his stripes we are healed. It's just easier to believe that than to start trying to complicate it with doing spiritual calisthenics, which create doubt. If you want faith, not just a quantity of faith, but a mature faith that does not doubt, you are going to have to get in God's word. Faith in God presumes that you know God. Faith in God is trusting God. The Word of God tells us, make your calling and election sure. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you, you turn your heart in a certain direction. This is very practical. If you are filling your heart and mind with hate and lust and everything this world has to offer, stop it. Number one, live in Philippians 4 8. Whatsoever things are true, honest, pure, just, lovely, or good report, if there be any virtue, any praise, think on these things. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you are filling your heart and your mind with a bunch of junk, stop that. Now you go, I thought you said that wouldn't build faith. I'm not wanting you to build faith that way. But if you'll declutter that mind, 
and begin focusing on things that are true and faithful and honest and pure and lovely, you'll make room for the Word of God to take root in the soul that is your heart. kind of faith we need is true faith. Knowing faith. That no-so kind of faith. The faith that does not doubt will only come by humbling yourself and learning and studying and believing God's Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And it is then, when you come to that mature faith, you can ask, you'll believe, and there will be no doubt that is going to happen because you know him and his desires have become your desires. You can pray the Lord's Prayer honestly, Lord. Not my will, but your will as, as your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. You become in total agreement with him. And you can have confidence that his will will be done. So here's the thing. Here's where we're going to end today. The most important item is, number one, you need to seek him and trust him for salvation. You need to commit your heart, life, and desire to Him and then do as me and Brother Harry was talking about yesterday. Seek Him and His kingdom first. And all this other stuff, He promises. Faith says, His word says, all these things shall be added unto you. Praise God. Will you stand this morning? I have faith to tell you this this morning. God is good. God is good. And you can trust Him today. Let's pray.